have been following my Instagram, you know that this episode is coming. Welcome to the Sambivant canned wine episode. Please welcome my two friends. Introduce yourselves. Gina Schober and Jake Stover. I've known you for a little while and what? I didn't know you had this like side project going on, but I was so excited to see these first in the grocery store and then I'm going to learn that you guys were the team behind it. I was even more excited. So um, I guess the first question, because I as much as I am intrigued by new things, um, I know nothing about canned wine. I don't know where it came from, how it's different, what we can expect as a consumer. So I figured I'd invite you guys to come and help me sort of break down any sort of misnomers, any sort of questions that people might have, questions that you guys get asked all the time. Um, so I think the first question is, why canned wine? Well, I mean, we started the brand about a little over two years ago, 2016 being our first vintage, and we really thought of it as we were driving back from the Sonoma Coast one weekend, and we were passing the Russian River, and at the time, the river was pretty low, but I was thinking of all my friends and family who are not beer drinkers and who really enjoy wine, and they don't know to pack, you know, corkscrews, glassware, and right. so thinking of a more accessible way to be able to drink wine and either go boating or skiing, golfing. So it's kind of where the idea started from. And yeah, I originally <laughs> thought she was crazy, <laughs> um, but by the end of that drive back, actually, she had me convinced. And a lot of it for us is we typically drink uh, lower alcohol wines that don't have a lot of oak influence and. For us, it seemed a natural fit to do stainless steel fermentations and then deliver it in a really convenient package that is the aluminum cake. And we wanted to elevate the canned wines that we'd already saw on the market by doing single vineyard, single variety, and really paying attention to where we source the fruit from. Yeah, I mean, single vineyard wines for cans, am I crazy? Like, I feel like I haven't seen that in any sort of store yet. <laughs> I think there is one or two other producers that are doing that. Yeah. We may be the only crazy people doing six. Yeah. <laughs> going to that extreme. You're doing, so all six of these are single vineyards. Single and variety. Yep. Yeah, organically vinyl. farmed, naturally made, vintage yeah. dated. <laughs> so we're wow. the only ones going to that extreme, but there are others, which I think is good. You know, more people coming out with higher end wines in can than single vineyard stuff because I think it gives more credit to what we're doing and to the, you know, the canned package in general. And you were making wine prior to the canned wine or this was your first exploration into the side of winemaking? This was mine, not Jake's, so. Yeah, I've uh, been in the, on the production side in the wine industry for about the past 11 years. For Aaron Jordan at Fela Wine Cellars for about oh. four years and worked for Aaron Pot for a little while. What makes a canned wine different than a wine that's coming in a bottle? There's little details that you wouldn't generally expect. One of which is, so if you purchase glass bottles, they come pre-packed in the box that you typically end up shipping the wine in or you know packaging the bottles in. That's not the case with canned wine. So we've had to get a little inventive in terms of solving every detail along the way. Also, uh, due to the volume requirements for purchasing to get printed cans, it's per skew really high. So for us to, to be able to do so many small lot interesting wines, we've had to uh, use heat shrink labels that are fully wrapped around the can, changes the design process, and, and you know, in terms of getting those adhered to the can and everything else. So where, so where did you go to find all of it? Is it find all of that information is that did you go to like beer companies that were canning beer or like where did you I mean does someone google like canning wine 101 well or like find ahead, like I'm a sorry. YouTube video I mean, <laughs> we were I don't know it was a lot of research we reached out to Ball the company that the can that makes the cans and basically begged them for you know being able to print cans and they were like no we're not stopping we can't stop wine 
to just do something really small. Your quantities have to be really high. So then it was, okay, where do we go next? And it was a lot of just phone calls and a lot of research and really just having to figure it out on our own because we didn't at the time know anyone else that was doing cans or at such a small level that we could talk to and say, hey, what do you do when you're trying to do really small craft wines and cans? So. I mean, are there still obstacles that you guys have or like foresee as far as canning wine goes? Obviously quality is really important to yeah. us and so currently we custom crush at a facility here in St. Helena. We're in the process of attempting to grab a lease on our own physical winery space as well as a tasting room and for us we want to have full control over all of the production uh, all the way through bottling and, and in addition we also farm a couple of these vineyards so wow. yeah we're, we're attempting to, <laughs> to do a lot yeah to, well to do to, to treat these just as we would anything that would go into a bottle and so uh, for us it's really important to have all that control and, and as we gain more and more control over the process um, our quality I think is only going to increase for, for right. that now. So as far as production goes pre-canning the wine what is different as far as the winemaking? For us it's really not different. Okay. Um, we do only just use presently uh, stainless steel fermenters for fermentation and aging but um, we're making these wines in a natural fashion, which means that we're just using uh, the native yeast that come in on the grape skins. We're not adding any yeast or any other types of nutrients. And so to that degree, really our only control over the fermentation is temperature and sort of uh, maceration mm -hmm. techniques. And have you had any issues as far as getting the wines to completely ferment or without, since you're not inoculating or, not, or only using wild yeast? No, we haven't at all. Great. At all. So yeah, it's it's it's. But um, you know, working at some other facilities that do that, it's I've seen that that's typically not an issue here. For us, it's making wines in small lots. Then it, it becomes more difficult to, mm -hmm. to to ferment in that way. I mean, obviously, the brand is called Sans. San? Sans. Sans. <laughs> Sans. 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 However you want to say it. Yeah. yeah exactly. How do you say it? I say sans, okay. but I hear and a lot you? of sans, so I try sans. not to correct but, anyone. Yeah, but it, sans rhymes with cans, so that kind of works. It does. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll say sans, because you say sans, okay. and it's <laughs> French for without. Um, so the name obviously comes from without additives, chemicals, preservatives, and that was important to you guys for any particular reason, or just because that's... Jake's really the one that came up with the name. We were trying to think of what to name our brand and we already had the idea that we wanted to do single vineyard, single varietal, make the wines naturally, not add any, you know, chemicals um, into the winemaking process. And so I think naturally that's probably just where it came from when it popped into your mind. <laughs> Tail end of that is sans pretense. Yeah. And so it, it, you know, this idea of without and, and also the convenience of the cans and, and the portability and just this idea that uh, really good wine can be without a lot of inputs. The extra stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, I'm all about non-pretense and like just drinking wine because it's fun and delicious mm -hmm. and doesn't need to be yeah. crazy anything. And obviously you guys know my feelings about screw shot wines and how annoying having a corked wine is. Um, so this kind of fits right under my mm -hmm. umbrella of things that I just think are fantastic. And you know, the first time we picked up this can immediately I was like, Oh my gosh, I need to take a trip to the coast and like yeah. just pop my roof off and like sit and drink canned wine. And I think that's it's such a nice thing to have because they're as easy as it is to pop off a, a, a screw top or even to like pull a cork on a wine, there is like something very charming about just popping pop the top. Yep. And for like, so my sister, my sister has celiac and her husband does not and they, he loves beer. And I, they're always at the beach, they're always like partying with their friends, sorry, not always, but often, <laughs> often <laughs> partying with their friends. And I feel bad because my sister's always like, well, I can't drink beer and like cider gets old mm -hmm. and I like wine, but then like, do you still feel like you're kind of like part of the party without by like having to like open a bottle of wine and yeah. pour it into a glass and there is like a little bit of pretense involved. So I always am looking for other things that might fit into making her life better and like this is definitely one of those things for people who are gluten-free who don't like beer or just want something easy and drinkable i will say i didn't realize that it was a 375 yeah. in the can yeah. so it's a half bottle of wine in this like tiny little thing <laughs> i didn't realize how much wine was in here which is great i mean it's something to consider um 
these wines aren't terribly high alcohol. I think most of them are what, like 12-ish percent? Yeah, 12 and a half, uh, 13, and then uh, the reds are 14. Yeah. But yeah, lower-ish. Moderate. For, yeah. yeah. I mean, high if it's a beer. So yes. Be, so like, be careful. If you have a, exactly. Yeah, full can. <laughs> that, I, and you know, speaking about what has been the biggest hurdle, at least on my end, is getting people to realize that that is a half bottle of wine. Yes. And it's two healthy glasses. Yeah. Um, because no one sees a can and thinks immediately a half bottle. No, I 100% did not realize how much wine it was until I went. I actually poured <laughs> it into a decanter and I was like, holy crap, that's a lot of wine. Yeah. I didn't realize how much wine was in there. So there's also this like pricing thing that's involved when you're looking at a can of wine and you're like, ooh, that's $15 or it's $25 for a can, forgetting that it's a full half bottle of mm -hmm. wine and how much, I mean, two, two healthy glasses, like you said, Probably closer yeah. to like three. Yep. Um, and how you pour it. So I think we should probably get into the wine. Obviously, they make six different single vineyard, single varietal can wines, canned or not wines, which is <laughs> impressive, like <laughs> on its own. When I was reintroduced to you guys again a couple weeks ago at the pink party, um, I think the first thing that caught my eye was the Riesling because Riesling just like screams ease and like summer and fresh and like obviously it should be in a can why not yep um yeah. so i think we should pop the reason first and this is coming from a vineyard in rutherford so yeah it's um, right here in napa valley exactly it's the mcgill vineyard uh on manly lane in rutherford and um it was planted it's uh, the vines are around 60 years old it's organically farmed but in the way that uh, it's actually no spray whatsoever so zero pesticides or herbicides either organic or not we're currently uh leasing this vineyard and, and doing the work ourselves so. wow yeah how has that been it's good. I actually I actually own a vineyard management business as okay. well. Okay. Oh, so, okay. That's how it's, yeah. it's a little easier. Yeah, so. <laughs> you like kind of know what's up. Yeah. That's, okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, all right. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. You can Cheers. definitely drink this out of the can, but we're sharing. So we'll... Did you notice how I like didn't even like sniff it? I just like went in. Went straight in. Yeah. That's great. Mm. It's so bright. There's like that great reasoning acidity and then it's just finishes completely dry but you still get that stone fruit that like apricot peach just like really pretty aromatically intense wine exactly. love this this is like this is destined to be in a can and just consumed outside for mm -hmm. days like today it's yeah. funny you mentioned my sister um is gluten intolerant mm -hmm. as well and this is her favorite wine oh really it's the riesling is she just can't stop with it she just wants it all the time it's so delicious yeah. i love this do you guys have favorites of your lineup? Is, this, is there one you gravitate towards more? For me, it depends. I personally, I love the Zinfandel. We serve that chilled, and originally I wanted a red that you could throw in the cooler mm -hmm. with the white and rosé and drink on a hot day wherever you were at and not feel like bogged down, like, you know, stained teeth and God give me water because <laughs> I've had a big wine or yeah. a big red. So that has been one of my favorites to drink in really hot weather outside. I think in 2016, we were agreed on that. In 17, we did a car Carbonic Carignan. We got married this past December, and so for Gina's wedding present, I built a bar, and we were able to pour the same vintage, the Carbonic, on tap at the wedding. Yeah. You so. built her a bar as your yeah. Yeah. what? With a bunch of old wine, wood wine boxes. That's yeah. all the the top of it. It's really pretty. So we have it on our house. And we have wine on tap. So which is oh. dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> you have a bar with like a permanent wine tap. Yeah. That's the greatest thing I've ever heard. So you. These are built to have like a slight chill on them? Yes, that's yeah. originally. And I mean, when we f the first time we canned our 16s, it wasn't really the intention, but I think we kind of found it by accident because at the end of the night, the Zinfandel was what we canned, for, was mm -hmm. what we canned last. And it came off the line so cold. And I just remember popping open a can and being like, this is so much better chill than mm -hmm. not. And so that's really when I started taking it out and showing it to buyers and accounts. I would show it chilled and say, you know, this is how we recommend, you know, you show it or sell it. You know, not everyone will be into that. Mm -hmm. and you might have to kind of prep some people that it's a red that isn't going to be room temperature, but. I love reds with a chill. I think reds are often served too warm. I don't think that I'm alone in that feeling. And when I first tried these, I felt like they all could really benefit from a little bit of a chill. They mm -hmm. just, and there's also something like 
and I don't know if it's just like a learned thing, but drinking from a can, it should be served with like a slight chill of coming course. out of a can. Like yep. it just kind of feels right. Yeah. But getting back to the Riesling, do you guys have any issues with people thinking the Riesling will be sweet? Because it's not, it's completely, I mean, it tastes yeah. bone dry to me. Yeah, so, I think yeah. there's still um, a fair number of people that when you tell them you have a Riesling, yeah. um, sweet. they kind of pass on to something else immediately in their head yeah. thinking that it's sweet. And then when we, when you tag it with, you know, this is a dry Riesling, right. they're interested to try it and usually yeah. pretty happy about it. It's true. I mean, I think the stigma is starting to sort of dissolve, but mm -hmm. there is still a hefty amount of people out there that think that all Riesling is created equal, which it's not. Um, and that all Riesling is sweet, which it's not. And this is definitely a great example of not only Riesling, but California Riesling and a dry Riesling. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of you who love German Riesling and love really old school Rieslings, this is a great example of a mineral driven, high acid, really bright, aromatic Riesling. This is a very classic and brightly correct Riesling that does extraordinarily well in a can. Oh, it's a pretty exciting little spot. It's great that now we can farm it and hope that we can continue making it for a while because you know there's as you know there's bit, not much reason left in Napa. That is true. It's used to yeah. be widely planted and now it's all been ripped out for cab or other right. bridles that are you know king here in Napa but yeah it's cool that we found this and we just hope we can be making wine for it for quite a while. Yeah. yeah. Is anybody else making wine from that vineyard? No, just us, but uh, Rory Williams. Oh, yeah, um, older. Yeah, he's just up the road, his Riesling oh, Vineyard. Yeah. So okay. It's kind of funny. It's, yeah, two okay. Riesling Vineyards in Rutherford on the same road. That's awesome. a surprise, but, yeah. Yeah. but cool. Another great example of the California Riesling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you um, checked out my Instagram a few weeks ago, I talked about Rory's Wines. Calder Rory is John Williams, a Frog's Leap's son, and he's got a great little label that specializes in things like Riesling and Charbono and yeah. Well, next for you guys? I feel like that seems like a... <laughs> we talked about that It's so funny ago. last time. Oh, you <laughs> talked about it. But I don't know. That would maybe... I don't know. But who knows? We were trying to think today of what else would we do to... Or this next vintage coming up, you know? What else will we add or what will we do different, you yeah. know, to kind of keep things interesting and exciting yeah. for us specifically and for, our, you know, our customers. So I don't know. We still have to figure that one out. So these vineyards are being farmed organically and not certified organically? But... Correct. Okay. Yeah. We, we haven't gone through the um, certification process. We just took over this vineyard and it's, it's who knows what will happen. like a five-year process and like a lot yeah. of litigation. Three years. Yeah. yeah. But the poor ranch is certified organic. Oh, is Mendocino. it? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's where we do our rosé from our, car our carbonic Carignan and Zinfandel, so right. they're certified. That they vineyard's been getting like a lot of traction lately. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's this cool little vineyard called Poor Ranch, and you guys can probably talk a little bit more about it than I can, but I know Peter Heights was getting some fruit from up there, and it's up in Mendocino. Mendocino, if you have been to Mendocino, it's like well worth a cool little drive. That's actually yeah. just a charming little yeah. hippie area, for lack of a better term. <laughs> and it's so cute, but there's some great fruit and wine coming out of Mendocino and this this poor ranch has been I've been seeing it more and more yeah. lately and I think the quality of what's coming out of there is just bananas and it's like it's so reasonably priced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pete Heights actually who introduced us to the pours. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, their property is super old. They've had it in the fam the poor family since the late 1800s and everything is dry farmed head trained, uh, certified organic, never been irrigated, and um, I mean really old vines. So the carbonic Carignan is from one of their oldest blocks that was planted in the 40s. Um, our rosé this year is a blend of three different blocks ranging in age from the uh, 40s, 70s, and 80s. I mean like either blocks planted in the 80s or like their young vines. Okay, so I wanna also taste the, the cab. I think the cab the cab is from Napa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, that was, um, this was what Jake really wanted to do, uh, Napa cab in a can, since there's no one else doing that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, cheers to that, guys. Yeah. That's really cool. Cheers. Yeah. Mmm. Well, it smells like Cabernet, and I suppose that's a good thing. <laughs> that's right. There's such great fruit, but it also like has a really pretty violet nose to it. Yeah, so this comes from a small vineyard up Soda Canyon Road. Mm -hmm. It's about 30 year old vines. I actually got a phone call to harvest this vineyard for someone last year, and they didn't have a buyer for the fruit yet, but they were trying to line up someone in 
the event that they got a buyer and so we were able to work out a deal and now we're farming this yeah as well. it was like it was like the beginning of september yeah. and jake was like we're gonna make cab this year and i'm like i don't think it's time i think we need to wait a little bit i mean we're doing all these other wines he's like no we're going to like exactly. we've got the fruit um we're i'm picking it in like 10 days and i was like okay i guess we're doing that now so this was september of 2017 yeah Correct. so we, we okay. picked it mid-september yeah but okay. it was like two weeks before that when you came home and you said that we yeah. had a, we, we were I might buying have known it. About, I might yeah. have known about it a little longer. Or he was waiting to kind of break that one to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love these like wine making husband and wife teams that like, like most husband and wife teams, like husband and wife comes home and they're like, honey, I bought like a new pair of shoes. And, like in Napa, wine making couples are like, hey, honey, I bought like a lot of Charbono and a little petite syrup. Yeah. <laughs> That's really Like true. the amount of times that I've heard this happen is like, I can no longer count on both hands it's actually kind of crazy and yeah super awesome that's really funny <laughs> yeah. so obviously that was pre-fire you guys didn't have any issues yeah we with did. anything fire related in 2017 no, we were really fortunate um and another kind of crazy coincidence there was a fire in the field behind this house like um two weeks before the fires and didn't affect the fruit at all we were able to harvest and get everything out and the fire department put that fire out mm -hmm. and so when the large fires came through uh this vineyard was spared and a lot of the uh, surrounding acreage and houses were burned to the ground wow. so it's still everything's fine we lost one row of vines i think but that's been replanted Wow. Obviously, I talk a lot about fruit and then quality of the fruit when you're tasting wine. And this, to me, smells very like right on the money ripe, not overripe and not underripe. And I think a lot of that has to do with when you guys harvested. Mm -hmm. So whereas a lot of times Napa cabs can be stereotyped into like big, bombastic, a little bit more over the top, super ripe fruit, this presents more to me in a very just evenly ripe, just kind of plucked off the, off the bush or off the tree, um, doesn't have like a lot of like any sort of candied or like baked elements to it. It's just really clean and really fresh. Across the board, I mean, we're attempting to make wines that just right. They're mm -hmm. spot on in terms of, because like, again, we're not adding, adding anything to them. So the harvest date's like really important. And the fear for us having never made a purely stainless steel fermented and aged Cabernet that went into an aluminum can, um, the fear was for one, picking too right and not having the backbone and balance of French oak to mm -hmm. kind of uh, smooth that out over a period of, you know, two years of aging typically. And then on the, the opposite side of that is picking too early and having things come across way too green. Yeah. And, yeah. and mm -hmm. I know that was a major concern of Gina's as well. And because this has gone through malolactic fermentation and that's natural as well for us to be able to get there, we had to do um, after the, the primary fermentation was finished mm -hmm. and the, the must is pressed off. We had to do pump overs with the juice itself and aerate it a bit to kind of round it out and, and get get it to move through mallow with some oxygenation. Yeah, and, right. and, and for that reason, I think the tannins are still pretty smooth and not too overbearing. Overbearing. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously these are not seeing any time in barrel and then they're going straight into can. So as far as oxygen exchange is concerned, is there any oxygen exchange within the can itself or is it completely airproof? It's completely yeah, it, airproof. It's, air, yeah. it's totally sealed and along with that, so in the filling process, um, all the cans are sparged with nitrogen gas um, and most bottled wine is as well. And then it moves from there to uh, forehead fillers, what we've used recently in the past that um, the, the, this entire lid is pressed onto the aluminum can itself. So that's a pretty wide mouth opening. So right after they're filled, they're all dosed with liquid nitrogen. And it's the sort of off gassing of that liquid nitrogen. The lid's pressed on immediately that allows you to get the uh, pressure on the can walls. Mm -hmm. And it creates an incredibly stable environment. And so for that reason, about half of these wines have no sulfur added whatsoever as well. Some of them to kind of uh, retain acidity. There's what would be considered minimal amounts of sulfur. So less than 35 parts per million total. Mm -hmm still I think internationally would be considered natural wine and it's an incredibly stable environment there's no UV penetration like there right. would be through a glass bottle. The sulfur question obviously it's an incredibly widely debated issue. <laughs> yeah for sure. Um, I am not anti-sulfur I think mm -hmm. sulfur yeah. Is, yeah. is a good thing and like like all things should be everything in moderation. Yeah. Very interesting about the liquid nitrogen I didn't know that's how this was happening 
And yeah, so with beer, um, which is typically carbonated, you don't need that nitrogen to get the pressure on the can wall. However, with wine, that's that's how you get that pressure and also force all oxygen out of the headspace of the can. And so if there's any issues in the production process where that, that pressure stability isn't there, then you actually have oxygen sitting above the level of the wine and below the lid. So you can have issues there over time with mm -hmm. pre-mox, basically. But, oh, interesting. Yeah. As far as storage of these goes, same principles apply, like keep it away from heat, keep it away from light. Thanks. I guess so. light yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, so light's so much, not as but... big of an issue. It's more a uh, huge temperature fluctuation, but it's actually a better insulator than glass as well. So we use fully enclosed case boxes. Gina wanted to wrap the Cabernets in tissue paper. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, we did. We, did. Uh, we were just kind of thinking about, well, we're going you know, to charge $25 a can. Oh my gosh. It's equivalent of a $50 Napa cab. So we really got to jazz this up. And we talked about like wrapping it and all this, and we never got around to it. But um, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe next time. <laughs> I appreciate the novelty of it, however, yeah. as like the person who frequently has to unbox. Yeah, right? The, it's a pain in the butt. Doing, like, so let me just break this down for you. When wine yeah. comes in here at press, I'm the one that has to undo yeah. all of this. And a lot of times, like the higher end the wine, it like, so it goes like this. It's like big cardboard box comes in. You open the box and it's like tissue paper, tissue paper, tissue paper. Inside that box, there's another wooden box. Yeah. Take that out. And then there's like the four open. screws. <laughs> in that box i'm like all right i'll undo all the screws you get that box open and then it's like wrapped again. three bottles just like intensely wrapped with tissue paper and you're like i know that's so much waste <laughs> yeah so much. it's a lot of waste so too. yeah it is a lot of it's a ton of waste and it drives me bananas and um i drive i yeah. anyway thank you for not tissue paper. <laughs> yeah you know you're welcome. I, ha I clearly have like some pent-up aggression it's about okay. this but i think it's cute that you're about to do that you were trying to throw it around, but then yeah. with the box, so that's where we came up with those boxes instead. And I really, so I really like these boxes. At least you can, you know, take them and, you know, carry them somewhere totally. or re you can even reuse it if you wanted to. What a great housewarming or like, yeah. um, actually this is a great housewarming because you don't need a wine theater thing yep. for people that are like just right, moving right. in or like if you're going to a dinner party or something, these are yeah. what a fun thing to bring. A lot of my friends who are new moms love the cans because life has gotten more difficult and they can just pop open a can That's in right. the middle of a crazy day That's or right. whatever. Mommy's so. got to have her can. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you'd like to add? Any misnomers that you, you just like need to get it off your chest? <laughs> I don't know. I think I did earlier with the cans, you know, like they're a half bottle. People question like, oh, it's kind of expensive compared to what else is out there. but reminding people that these are half bottles and that, you know, we're taking it a little bit, you know, one step further. Right. So you'll we even just, even just having the vintage date on the cans totally. is, you know, more than what you'll find out there. And there's nothing wrong with the other canned wines. They, every, I think most wines all have a place, totally. a time and a place and um, a purpose. And so, you know, we're just trying to find a different one, I yeah. guess you could say. Yeah. How long will these keep for? We don't know. I know. It's kind of, I mean, we'll have a library, <laughs> library cans. Yeah, no, um, we'll hold some back. And, and um, you know, it what, it what it really comes down to is with aluminum cans of any kind, so uh, the tomato, canned tomatoes you have in your cupboard um, is the corrosivity of the product that's inside of the can. Um, and for one, because we're actually not adding any chemicals, that really helps uh, in terms of shelf life. but. Uh, the other aspect is wine's way less corrosive than, say, Coca-Cola. So, um, no one has a definite answer for that, and I've heard uh, that UC Davis has done some ex uh, some experiments that uh, they think it should, in terms of aging, um, age slower than in bottled wine, but that that's due to the environment. So. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> We've noticed so far that the 16s, I think they all pretty much have tasted the same as they did, you know, when we first canned them about a year ago. The Zinfandel, Definitely. I think, is, if anything, been more expressive mm -hmm. and aromatic, which I think is great. But the Rosé Sauvignon Blanc, to me, tastes the same as they did, you know, last year. Cool. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll keep tabs on yeah. what's going on with Sons. Mm -hmm. And until then, 
Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank, Thank you so cheers. much. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. Sure. Guys, drink and wine. It's awesome. Yep. And uh, check these guys out. You are at Sands Wine Co. Yes. on Instagram. So the link um, and the link to their website will be below where you can purchase all of their wines directly from the website. It's also available in some retail places around, definitely around Napa. Yep. I don't, yeah, a lot in Napa, Napa, San Francisco. And we've got that all listed. And Yeah, you guys can find all of that on the website. Please please, please leave some comments below with questions, um, thoughts on canned wine, and uh, I will see you guys all very soon. Please be sure to like this video and subscribe to it. And thank you again so much for watching. I will see you all next time. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>